let's ask questions and etc. But then at some point, let's cut off ourselves. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's Nabil, Nabil Ipal from Dana University, that's the right one. Okay. Okay, um, oh wait, I should use this microphone, I guess, yes. Actually, let me check, uh, this one doesn't seem to be working. Um, oh, okay, so yeah, I don't know. It, it was working this morning, so I... Oh, okay. Uh, maybe we'll start talking, can I ask you? Don't ask me. Just listen. Well, we'll start talking. People can probably hear me, even if I'm standing here. Right? Can you hear me in the back? Uh, yeah, people can. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna walk around. No? We can't hear you in the recording. Oh, in the recording. I see. Can you switch this okay. on somehow? The technician's coming down with some batteries for the microphone. Okay, here. okay, excellent. In the meantime, I'll just stand here and speak very loudly. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So I'd like to begin by, uh, by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me to be here and for setting up this amazing meeting. I've been having a wonderful time. So um, today, the title of my talk is Towards an Effective Description of Chiral Magneto Hydrodynamics. Uh, that's a, a very long, a very long word. I'll explain what I mean by this. I'll explain the word towards, which is doing a lot of work in this title, actually. And uh, also, I'm going to tell you about what this work is based on. Part of it is based on this paper uh, with my student, Arpit Das, who's in the back over there, and Ruth Gregory. And part of it is based on work in progress with Arpit and with a, a now faculty in, in Bangkok, uh, Napat Puvutikul. But um, to be honest, most of the time I'm going to spend setting up the problem, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about, about these papers. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, I want to start very generally. This is going to be a talk about hydrodynamics. So let me remind everyone why hydrodynamics is fun. So suppose you have an interacting quantum field theory at finite temperature. Okay. So it's doing its thing. It's interacting. It's very complicated. And what you want to do is you want to keep track of the long distance physics at late times and long distances. Okay. You want to understand that. This is a very general problem. Uh, what do we need to keep track of? So this theory will typically have many different excitations, but most things in the theory will evolve quickly at microscopic scales. Okay? So for example, my theory has a temperature, so one microscopic scale is the temperature, for example. Okay? Because they're evolving quickly, many things can be ignored if you care only about long distance physics. But some things cannot be ignored. So for example, suppose you have a conserved charge. Okay? If you create a lump of conserved charge, it cannot just vanish over a fast time scale. What has to happen instead is it has to spread out. Okay? And that spreading out takes time. So for example, if the size of your box is, is, say, L, then if you have a conserved charge, the typical frequency of evolution of that conserved charge will be 1 over the size of the box, which can be made arbitrarily slow. So what that means is we should keep track at least of all of our conserved quantities in the low energy theory. Okay. Hello? Hello? Is this working? Yes? yes? I would say no. But... <laughs> <laughs> hello? Hello? Is this working? Yeah. Working? Oh, oh my god. Okay. No. <laughs> I think it wasn't before. <laughs> Give me one second. Anyone has any questions? Um, Hello, how's this? Is this okay? Um, okay, perfect. Okay, good. Um, so where was I? Anyway, so we should at least keep track of all of the conserved quantities in our low energy theory. So for example, consider some field theory that has a stress tensor and a, a conserved U1 current, an ordinary one. These are, the, say, the conserved quantities. There is a very well-established framework to understand the low energy effective theory at long distances, and that framework is called hydrodynamics. Okay. So the way this works is you have some fluid degrees of freedom. For example, your fluid velocity and your energy density and maybe your charge density. And there is a well-established framework to tell you how the microscopic current, so J and T here, are related to those fluid degrees of freedom. And once you have this relation, these guys, the conservation laws, are the equations of motion of this system. So I think everyone has seen this at some point, even if you don't work on it. And uh, let me just say a few words about hydrodynamics. Uh, number one, in principle, it is dictated entirely by the symmetries. Once you know the symmetry, there is an algorithm to get these guys out. Okay? Number two, it is a genuine effective theory. Okay? This is the first term in some sort of derivative, expan derivative expansion, sorry, and you can keep improving it order by order by order in an expansion in derivatives. So it's a genuine effective theory framework that in principle you can make as accurate as you like. 
And the third point is, it is still an evolving field today. Even though this is like one of the first things we learned in undergrad physics, the, the framework of hydrodynamics is still continuously evolving. Sort of, um, I'll mention some of these developments in, as I go through the talk, but it continues to evolve today. We continue to learn more and more about how to formulate hydrodynamics, how to solve problems in hydrodynamics. And today, I'm going to tell you about one problem that I think does not yet have a satisfactory um, hydro description, which is going to be anomalous magnetohydrodynamics. And I'll spend most of the time explaining exactly what I mean by this theory. Okay? Yes. Uh, which is the, sorry? Um, oh, very good. So that depends on the microscopics, which is sort of missing here already. But you'll have some microscopic scale. Like, for example, at least the temperature. That, you can imagine the temperature is doing that. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Um, mean free path? Mean, mean free path, also a good scale. Um, you know, that, that, sort of, um, that sort of prejudices you against the idea you have an underlying particle description in your system, right? You, you might not. Like in, in ADS-CFT, we typically don't. But... You know, but, but yeah, that's a perfectly good, good underlying thing. Yeah. There will always be such a scale. Okay, good. So now let me explain what I mean by anomalous magnetohydrodynamics. So consider this quantum field theory, which everyone knows. Consider QED, massless QED, in four dimensions, okay? A really familiar theory. Uh, so it's Maxwell e &M coupled to massless Dirac fermions. I want to study this theory at finite temperature by which I mean I want to develop a hydrodynamic theory that is in the same universality class as this theory. Okay? That's going to be the goal of today. So this sounds like a very simple problem, and I want to argue that actually there's it, it a lot of structure here. Okay? So this is what I'm going to tell you about. But you know, what, what is this? What's happening in this theory? I heat it up. I have a bunch of massless fermions floating around. They're all coupled to the e &M field. So this is the rough idea. These are electric field lines, and the particles are sloshing around and doing their thing. So I want to answer, what is the hydrodynamic theory describing this system? Okay. So um, the first question you should ask is then, OK, what are then the symmetries of this system uh, exactly? And again, this is a little bit subtle. So I'm going to spend some time telling you what the symmetries of the system are. Okay. So first, you might be surprised when I say this is subtle, because we've all studied this theory for, forever. So let me first imagine a situation where we freeze electromagnetism. Okay. okay, so consider A as an external gauge field for now. Okay, ignore A's dynamics, A is a fixed external source. Then the symmetries are super well understood. There is a conserved vector current, or there's a current that you can write in a way that is, it's conserved, psi bar gamma mu psi. You can set things up so that it's conserved. And there is an axial current, psi bar gamma mu gamma five psi. If you look at this Lagrangian, it looks like it's conserved. But um, as we all learned, um, people say in kindergarten, but when people say in kindergarten, they really mean in the first year of grad school. So as we, as we learned in the first, second year of grad school, uh, this current is actually not conserved at the quantum level. If you actually calculate a Feynman diagram that looks like this, then you find that d mu j mu is equal to f wedge f. Okay? Now remember, A is a fixed external source, which means this guy here is a fixed and very precise function of this applied external source. Nowadays, this kind of thing is normally called an Atoft anomaly. Okay? And this is very useful. You can use this to figure out all kinds of things about the, the dynamics of the system. Okay? So that's the situation if A is a fixed external source. You have an Atoft anomaly where the non-conservation of J is given by this precise function of the sources. Okay. Any questions about this point before I move on? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to set the axial source to zero throughout this talk. This A is the one that couples to JV. In this entire talk, I'm going to set the axial source to zero. You can easily put it back, and everything I'm going to say, it just adds more stuff to the equations. Yeah, that's a very good point. This F is the one that couples to JV okay, in this thing. That's an extremely important point. Yeah, thank you. Good. Any other questions? So, okay. Good. Okay, now that's fine for when uh, you freeze A. Okay, now what about dynamical A? So what about dynamical E and M? What happens then? This is more complicated. It's complicated enough that I want to take a step back and just say some general words about symmetry before getting into the guts of what's actually happening. So many of the things that I'm going to say now, Inyaki already said yesterday. I'm just going to repeat them in my notation. Okay. So um, we're going to require some generalizations of the concept of symmetry to really make sense of this problem. So first, let's just understand some basic facts about normal currents. Okay. So say you have a normal one index U1 conserved current, grad mu j mu equals 0. Um, what does a normal current count? 
A normal current counts particles. I think everyone knows this fact. Let me just uh, say a few words about how to actually see that from the equations. So for example, in this room, there is a conserved person number. Suppose I want to count all the people in the room. What I do is I integrate over all the three dimensions of the room. Okay, and everywhere I go in this integral, if I say a person, I count one, two, three, four, five. Eventually, I catch all the people in this room. And now, because there's a conserved person number, I can evaluate the same integral later in time, and I'll get the same answer. Okay? Here's a picture of this. Here are the person world lines, and here is the integral I did at a fixed time slice. I can move it up, and I get the same number. There's a somewhat fancier way to say this. If you write this in form language, you get that d star j equals to zero, where j is this current. Consider integrating star j over a co-dimension one manifold, so a time slice, for example. Now, if you take this co-dimension one manifold and you deform it slightly, because d star j is zero, this integral q does not care if you deform it. In other words, I've defined a topological operator that does not care. You can deform it up and down in whatever way you like, and the answer, the charge, is independent of that. So in fancy language, you can say this defines a u1 valued topological surface operator, which is co-dimension one. Okay? This is just a fancy way to talk about having a conserved charge. Now, one thing that's important is we often like to exponentiate this. If Q is the generator of an infinitesimal U1 transformation, it's often useful to exponentiate it and write U, some operator, which is the exponential of Q, where here alpha is U1 valued. OK? OK. So I'm just saying I think things everyone knows in slightly fancy language. So now, here is a natural thing to do once you start writing things like this. Why do we need to stick to j having only one index? You could imagine, for example, having a higher form symmetry which involves a j that has two indices. So this is a very simple idea, but I think it was first understood carefully in this very nice paper by Gairo, Kapustin, Seiberg, and Willett. And these ideas have been fueling a lot of development in the field lately, actually. So let me just tell you a bit about this. If you have, for example, a two-index anti-symmetric, this is a form, j, capital J is a form. If you have a two-index anti-symmetric current, it actually no longer counts particles. What it counts is strings. Okay? So this new index here, you should imagine this extra index now tells you which direction the string is pointing. This should sound plausible. Let's just try to run through the same thing we did with the people analogy again. Imagine the room is full of strings that, are, that can't end. They cannot end in space and time because I have a conserved density of strings. How do I count this conserved number of strings? Well, now, because the strings can't end in space or in time, imagine if they're just poking through this giant screen, I don't have to integrate over the whole room. I can just integrate over where the strings poke through the screen. So I integrate over only a two-dimensional manifold now. And now I can pull that forward in space or bring it up in time, and I'll always get the same conserved string number. Okay? The math behind that looks almost exactly the same. If you write it in form language, you write d star j equals to 0. And now you integrate star j over a co-dimension 2 manifold to get a conserved string number. But all the formulas look pretty much exactly the same. This is the idea of a higher form symmetry. A higher form symmetry is the symmetry principle that results in a conserved string number rather than a conserved particle number. OK? OK. So um, again, in, this is a picture of this. Uh, this actually is the two-dimensional string world sheet, and this is actually the charge operator, uh, to, to make the analogy precise. And um, in the same way as before, it's often helpful to exponentiate this and generate then a u1 value topological co-dimension 2 surface operator. OK. OK. Are there any questions about this higher form symmetry before I move on? OK. So this idea, this is called a one form symmetry. OK. It's one form because uh, the number of indices here is 1 plus. This is annoying, but there's an, off, there's an offset between the number of indices and, and the forminess of this symmetry. OK. okay. So now that we have this under our belt, let's return to the situation uh, where e and m is dynamical. So first of all, because e and m is dynamical, this thing here now is fluctuating. So a is a fluctuating field. The vector current is gauged, so it's no longer a global symmetry. Okay? So we should ignore this. This is not a global symmetry anymore. But there is a new one-form symmetry associated with the conservation of magnetic flux. Okay? This j mu nu, which is epsilon contracted against f, is obviously conserved by the Bianchi identity. And what that means is there is a one-form global symmetry associated with this. 
What this is doing is, you see, magnetic field lines are things, are strings, and they don't end. They're conserved. This is just telling you that magnetic field lines are conserved. Okay. So um, Jamie and you just counts magnetic flux density. This is, I claim, a useful way to think about ENM. You can learn many useful things. So for example, the photon in four dimensions, the one that through which you can see you know, me, is actually can be thought of as a goldstone mode of the spontaneous breaking of this higher form symmetry. Okay? So but really, you should just think of this as a normal global symmetry, just like the ones with only one index. OK, yes, question. Yeah, uh, it sounds trivial, right? It, it's actually not. Uh, it's actually not. So there's a few points here. So first of all, it looks trivial, but of course you could do an electromagnetic duality, and since suddenly it doesn't look so trivial anymore, right? So the statement you made about it being a closed form is actually there's a lot more happening there than it looks like. That statement is not invariant under duality. Uh, second, more operationally, you'll see that you can get a lot of useful mileage from this. Even you know, it's a useful it's a useful principle. I think what I might say is even if you have you can often get these topologically conserved currents, and they're actually very useful, typically. They're not trivial. They usefully constrain the structure of the theory. I think that's what I'm saying. Okay. So yeah. Good. Um, any other questions? Okay. Okay. So now, how about the axial current? What's happening with the axial current? So remember before, I had that d mu j mu was equal to f wedge f. Uh, when ENM was frozen, this was a Toft anomaly, and we understood it very well. But now that ENM is no longer frozen, the, the field strength is fluctuating around like crazy. And uh, now this is an operator, which is just non zero, okay, generically. And so it just looks like the current is simply not conserved anymore. Okay? It looks like we just lost the current. Now, first of all, there's one thing I want to write here. You can write this, of course, in terms of this J, which was defined as star F. This, if you write it in terms of J, it looks like there might be something kind of universal going on because somehow the non the non conservation of this is related to a conserved current for a different symmetry. So that's one indication there might be something universal happening here. It turns out this is true. The true situation of what's going on with the symmetry is actually much more subtle and was explained very recently, about three months ago, in terms of non invertible symmetries. So now I'm going to take a few slides to explain to you what this non-invertible symmetry means in this context. Okay. Okay. So this is again based on paper, uh, a recent, there's two papers that came out roughly the same time by these authors. I highly recommend them. Uh, they're, they're very interesting, and I'll try to explain the, the key points of them to you now. So let's try to make something useful, to make a conserved charge out of this non-conserved current. Okay. So what do you do? Well, you know, d star j equals to f wedge f. So there's a strong temptation to define a new thing, which is j minus a wedge dA. Okay? This seems like a very reasonable thing to do. For, because if you take d of this, then the d star j is equal to f wedge f, and that cancels against the d of this. And so you end up getting something whose d is 0. You end up getting something divergenceless. Okay? But of course, this is bad, because there's an A sitting in there. And so this putative conserved current is not actually gauge invariant. Okay? So we should not work with that conserved current. OK, let's, let's try to salvage this. This is not gauge invariant, but you know, I can at least integrate it. right? Let me integrate it over some, some co-dimension one manifold, over some time slice. If I integrate it, then that's better, because the integrated turn Simons form is gauge invariant under small wiggles of the small gauge transformations, gauge transformations that are continuously connected to that entity. Okay? So this Q looks potentially like it might be OK. okay? And we can try again to make a topological surface operator like before okay, by exponentiating this guy with some factor alpha there. But now there's a problem, because you see this alpha is multiplying this chern simons form. And churn simons forms aren't actually invariant under large gauge transformations unless alpha is an integer. Okay. So I think many of you have seen this. For those of you who have not, let me just say a few words about how to see this quickly. You see, if you look at the integral of A wedge dA, consider putting this on a manifold that has a non-trivial one cycle. Like consider that my M3 is like S1 cross S2. Okay. 
Then there are gauge transmissions who wind around this one cycle, okay? And those guys shift A by a finite amount. By, where, by A, I mean A around the one cycle. Those shift by a, a finite amount, like an integer, okay? And of course, you can have DA being non-zero on this, this S2. That's also an integer. So what that means is you will get this whole thing shifting by an integer. And that's bad. It's only okay if you exponentiate it. Then that integer will be trivial so long as alpha is 2 pi or a multiple of 2 pi or something like that. Okay? So the point is this thing only makes sense if alpha is an integer, but then this is useless because this charge was quantized, the axial charge is quantized, and so this U operator tried to define is always 1. And therefore, I have failed at doing anything useful with this. This is basically where the situation stood until those papers uh, before. Okay. Now, it feels like there's no useful conserved charge, but there's something that you can do, which is the following. Let me just press on and try to make sense of this. Let me try to generate a fractional alpha, so a, a fractional phase rotation, 1 over n, where n here is an integer. Okay? Let me try to make sense of this guy. The idea of these two papers is the following. Yeah. Uh, this, this thing you mean? Why, why is it trivial? Ah, because you see, um, this alpha is now an integer always, right? Uh, and Q is quantized because basically it's coming, this thing is just there to tidy up the gauge invariance. The, the quantization condition on this is coming from this star J. And star j is going to be quantized, because it's a compact u1 thing. So what this means is I am exponentiating something which is always 2 pi times an integer. It, this is no longer, this is no, uh, that's true, but the Hilbert space is still, you, you'll see there's something subtle happening. The Hilbert, it's not a u1, but the Hilbert space still has quantized values of this guy. Okay. The a's don't change this, no. The a's don't change this fact. That's right. What, what you can do is, you see, if you have a non-trivial number there, an integer that appears there, then you can get an unbroken zk. Okay? But I'm looking right now at the minimal case where I'm trying to break it as much as possible. In that case, it's broken down to a z1. Okay? I, I will salvage it in a, or they, they will salvage it in a, in a second. But, but yeah. Good. Okay. So, um, so here is the idea. Let me, try, let me try now to make a fractional, a fractional alpha. Assume it's a spectrum the size of this has the yeah, I'm assuming it's, it's the, I think that's almost always the case. Yeah, right? It's a, it's a um, I think all, I'm assuming compactness of this U1 symmetry. That's correct. Yes, that's right. Uh, none of this makes sense otherwise. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming compactness of the U1. That's correct. Yeah. I think that, yeah, if you think about the fermions, it's obviously the case. Yeah, and I want to restrict my attention to, to that case. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, let's now do the following thing. So I want to make sense of this. Okay? I want to generate a useful symmetry transformation. And um, so I want to make sense of this guy. The idea is the following. Let's introduce a new dynamical field, which I'm going to call little a. It's a little gauge field, little a, which is defined only on this defect. Okay? In that case, you can write the following object down. I can write down the following thing. A is dynamical. I'm always path into getting over A. And there's an action that I can write down here where I have A wedge DA, a dynamical Chern Simons form on the defect alone, and then I couple A to the photon field, which lives everywhere in the bulk. Okay. Now, this action, this thing here, is a totally well defined thing because look, my N here is in the numerator, okay? not in the denominator. So this is completely fine. But now imagine integrating out A, okay? So I look at the equation of motion of A, and what I find is that dA, d little a, equals to d capital A divided by n, with an n in the denominator. If you now put everything in, then you actually reproduce this action again, okay? But there are no distributions. Sorry? There are no distributions. There, these, this, is the, this is the response of this. So this is the response function. If you imagine this is generating a response for the external source A, this is the response function from this. So once you integra integrate out A, they are equivalent, except that it makes sense again. Okay? Is that, is that you know, th this is what I'm trying to say here. The, the second line and the third are not equivalent. 
they are not yeah. equivalent. It, that's true, because this was not well defined. That, that's right, that's right. There are extra degrees of freedom here. But my claim is that the response, yeah. Yes, yes, you should not, you should not do this thing brutally. Yeah, I think you should not do this thing brutally. This is a, this is a mnemonic. But the, the right, I think that the, a useful way to think about this is this sort of action comes up all the time. For example, if you're doing the quantum Hall effect, this is the response function of like the u equals to n quantum Hall or 1 over n quantum Hall effect. And that response is generated by this, basically. So all the, 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 in, the insight of these papers is to realize that you can do this. You can generate this fractional turn Simons term if you introduce some new degrees of freedom to make it work. Okay? So I just want to say this is exactly the same thing that Inyaki talked about, except this is a continuous symmetry, not a discrete one. Okay? But all the structures that are involved, all the philosophy is exactly the same. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, how am I doing on time? This, this is a zero form charge, so it's just counting axial charge. Because this is, a, this is integrated over a three manifold, the charge operator is counting the axial charge. This is a fancy version of the axial charge. Okay? Okay. So what I have done is I have constructed a new topological charge operator at the cost of introducing a new field A. Okay, was there a question? Oh, sorry, many questions. Yes. Yeah. I haven't thought about that at all. Uh, it's a good question, but you think this cannot be non-abelianized? Probably not. Uh, probably not. At a formal level, I should say this is making heavy use of the fact that actually D A is associated with a uh, a one-form symmetry, and that statement is definitely not true if you have a dynamical non-abelian gauge theory. So I suspect it will be quite complicated. Yeah. 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 Um, more questions? Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they're, they're not, I think that equivalent is not, maybe not quite the right thing to say, uh, I, I think, here. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not equivalent. It, this does the job of what I wanted to do in that this object is topological and is equivalent under small wiggles of A to the top one, but it transforms differently under large gauge transform. I think that's the right, that's the right way to put it. This is a topological object that has the algebra with local operators that I want, um, and is equivalent, yeah, what is the, what exactly is the, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the right statement is here about, uh, about how to, um, yeah, but um, that's right. The second is the correct thing to do. The second is the correct thing to, the second is the correct thing to do. Yeah, that's right, that's the second is the correct thing to do. And um, yeah, that's right. That's probably, that's probably, the, that's probably the, the strongest statement to, to make here. Okay. Sorry, little, all the A's are dynamical. Little A is dynamical on the defect. Big A is dynamical in the bulk as well. Yeah. Over little A? Oh, I, I am, excuse me. A little, this is dynamical. I'm, I am just not writing it down. Yeah, that's right. That's right, that's right. The precise thing is U is defined as a path integral over little A of the exponential of this object here. That's, that's the right thing to say. Yeah, sorry if that was not clear. OK, good. Um, all right, so let me just say a few words about this. Um, this is what is happening here. This is the object. You should imagine this thing is rotating this psi by a fractional, like it's rotating psi by e to the i over n gamma 5 psi. That's what this part does. These things deal with the gauge invariance problem, the, the subtle non-conservation. Um, you can promote this, this 1 over n. The fact that it's 1 over n is not important. Well, you can replace it with any rational number by using a slightly fancier TQFT there. Okay? So you should really imagine this generates almost all of U1. Uh, the current construction generates only sort of a, a rational filling of U1. Um, but rationals, okay. So the philosophical question here about rationals versus reals, but you get a lot of symmetry, okay? It's almost continuous, all right? And um, it's called a non invertible symmetry because uh, it's sort of easy to see it, it has no inverse. All right. Imagine taking the one with plus 1 over n and the one with minus 1 over n and combining them together. Uh, that doesn't give you nothing again, because even though this part will cancel, you still have two different sets of dynamical gauge fields on these two defects, and they will couple to things and result in some non-trivial object that's left over. So this object does not have an inverse. Okay. And uh, there's been a huge amount of work in non invertible symmetries recently. I started writing references, but then I decided after a while to not do that and just refer you to Inyaki's talk, where he gave many references. Okay. 
but this has been a, a very, very active field lately. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, the, the, defect the, defect operator, the defect operator has extra degrees of freedom living on it. The bulk does not. Whether or not you want to call that a different theory seems to be a, a matter of taste, but I would say you're probing the existing theory with something. Okay? That's, that's what I would say. The defect can be not, it, it can be closed, it can be a sphere, it could go off to infinity. This is all totally fine. With this construction, it's all totally fine. Okay? So I think really the thing that's, uh, sorry, there's some more questions that I didn't answer. Uh, yes? The rationals uh, are dense in the real, so what's stopping you from taking the closure of this and considering that there is a one? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about this. I really feel like this should be possible personally, but, but the, the constructions that there, it, it does rely on the fact that it's, it's rational. You know, I think, okay, I think that, well, let, let me. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. Uh, yeah, so yes, I think I just want to agree with you. Let me, let me just say a few things. You see, when you have a continuous symmetry, you have a local conserved current, okay? Here, I'm pretty sure you don't have a local conserved current. That, I think, uh, is true. So the question is really, what did you want to do with the fact that it was a, you know, when you say, I have a continuous symmetry, what did you really want to do with that? Typically, you want to deal with the fact that it's a conserved current, and that you don't have, okay? So you could call it a, a continuous symmetry without a conserved current. I think that's maybe a... A reasonable thing. Uh, yeah, again. Um, Do you have a oh, so, sorry, sorry, there are two questions. Uh, let me take Sean's uh, uh, first and come back. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, th there, there are many questions. Let me just say these two things, then I'll, then I'll take the questions again. So, um, there's no local conserved current, but this topological operator is really useful, okay? You can do with this many of the things you wanted to do. Like, for example, if you want to forbid terms in your effective action, like the mass term for the fermion, you can use this to do that, okay? Because that thing will rotate under the action of this charged operator, okay? You can write down selection rules on local operators. Like, you can make sure that you never have, you know, in a process involving scattering of fermions, you don't violate this axial symmetry. This thing can be used to show that, okay? But there are also many questions. Like, for example, you know, is, is there a Goldstone theorem for this? It's really confusing, because it's like subtly non, almost continuous, but not quite in the way that Stefano was pushing on. Uh, so, you know, is there a Goldstone theorem? If you, you can ask now if a symmetry is spontaneously broken, that's now a very well-defined question, and you might hope that that would imply a Goldstone theorem, and Inyaki and I are trying to figure this out right now. There's a more general question, which is just, what are the phases of the symmetry? You know, like, there should be phases where it's spontaneously broken, where it's unbroken, there should be critical points. Like, there's really a, a large body of machinery that I think is fun to develop for this. Okay, sorry, your question, Peter. Um, it's a good question. This, this object generates something in the path integral. Uh, you could look at the action of that on things in the Hilbert space, but you will need to integrate out this extra thing. So I think you need to add some extra degrees of freedom you know, to, that interact. I, I think it's like the states evolve, but then they interact with some extra states for a moment and then keep evolving again. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Sort of, yeah. I, I think that's what one has to do. Uh, but I've not, I say I've not talked too hard about it, and I don't think it's in the, it's, it's in the papers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell from? I mean, it's it's not clear that such a limit exists because you have to pass integrate over A, and then you get that when you. It's true that the rationals are dense, so you get very large denominators. I mean, those are the real numbers, and so this has kind of infinite action. So it's not clear that that, that limit exists if this is a in the dense space. Yeah. Domain wall separating two rationals, you're saying the two, the two rationals that are distant, as, as close together as rationals can be. Yeah, see, one gets into philosophical uh, questions like this, I think. I don't think I have anything very smart to say on this. If you want to talk afterwards, uh, we've been trying to come up with a construction where we relax the rationality uh, thing. So I confess, I personally find it a little, a little bit weird that the rationality of something is important uh, in, in physics, but maybe, you know, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, can I ask yeah. It can be any three manifold you like. So um, it's easiest to understand, I think, when it's. The bulk is R4, yeah. Yeah, you can take it to be R3 and R3 slice. Um, say? Yeah, you can make it an S3. The S3 is a very useful thing to do because you can use that to. That's the formalism where you can define, uh, find useful selection rules, actually. If you make it an S3, then you can wrap a local operator with it, and then it transforms that local operator in a particular way. 
Okay, so that's you know you can take it to be whatever you like. Yeah. But like you know if you want to count the charge, then you typically take it to be all of space. Um, yeah, I think that then you, um, if it go, it's true if it goes up to infinity. I think that the question about whether it's a different theory or not when you put a localized defect is sort of a, a matter of taste, I think. Yeah, but yeah, if it goes up to infinity, then it goes up to infinity. You need to put boundary conditions at infinity. Yeah. Then it's, okay, then in that case, it's a different theory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But not a different, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay good. Okay, so anyway, so this is a very nice story, and I, I recommend uh, uh, everyone to, to take a look at these papers. I think I personally found it uh, very nice that there are new things to say about QED, okay? That, that there's still new things to understand. I, I found this to be a very nice, a nice story. Okay, so now let me come to the problem I actually want to solve, though. You see, the problem I want to solve is, what is the finite temperature hydrodynamic theory with this symmetry structure? It has a one-form symmetry associated with magnetic flux conservation. And it has a vector field, a vector operator, current, you could call it, which is not conserved, but its non-conservation is precisely given by J wedge J, where J is this guy right here. Okay. So we now know that this structure means that you, there is a zero-form non-invertible symmetry associated with this. Okay. And the question I want to ask is, what is the finite temperature hydro theory describing this? Right? This will answer the question about what is QED at finite temperature. Now, this has become rather formal. So I just want to say a few words about what this, what this sort of thing means physically. You see, um, if you just, uh, for a second, uh, imagine uh, integrating. Let's just imagine doing the thing that we, we were just told is wrong, OK? Where you have this thing which is conserved, which is star j plus A wedge DA. Let's just look at, let's just look at this anyway, okay, and just think about this. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So let's just take a second and look at this, where I have star JA plus A wedge DA. This is the thing I told you is wrong and bad, and you shouldn't think about it, but let's, for a second, throw caution to the wind and think about this anyway. Just imagine integrating this. Don't exponentiate anything. Don't, don't add any degrees of freedom. Just integrate this overall space. You see, this is some number of particles. This is an axial charge. What is this measure if you integrate it? This measures, under certain situations, the linking of magnetic field lines. For example, if you can set up two magnetic field lines to look like this, like two closed loops, just set that up somehow, this integral measures whether or not they link. Okay? This is a well-known fact. From, it's called magnetic helicity. It's a well-known fact in plasma physics. And so what this is saying is you can have a helicity change, okay, an axial charge change, provided you also link together two magnetic field lines. Okay? That's, that's what's happening. That is the symmetry principle captured by this thing, which we can now finally very formally write in terms of these non-invertible symmetries. And this is a sort of very reasonable thing. The dynamics, this is a very reasonable thing to look for. In, in MHD, actually, magnetic field lines don't want to, they, at lowest order on derivatives, they actually don't ever change linking. Linking is a conserved quantity in some sense. And so trying to write a theory to describe this is a very reasonable thing to do. And if this is possible, this will be a universal theory for what is called chiral magnetohydrodynamics. And that's my goal, and that's what I'm going to work towards in the remaining. Uh, um, yeah, how much time do I have? Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Sixteen years to live. Okay. What I'm going to try to do is, Lisa, this is okay. I'm going to try to take ten minutes to to talk about the the hydro story, and then we'll. Then, then I'll, I'll stay until we are forced to leave by the authorities. Okay. All right. Um, the authority. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, we'll play by ear. Okay. But anyway, this, you see, the truth is, this is the point. And um, uh, so now I'm going to try to tell you what we're trying to do. And uh, the truth is, this is something that interested me for a long time. So I'll tell you a bit about, about the work that we've done on this. This symmetry principle only appeared recently and is, is guiding, I think, what will be a, a proper resolution of this problem. Okay. Good. So um, there's been a lot of work on this okay, field. Let me just tell you a bit about the previous work. So first of all, if you, for a second, forget about this axial charge and just reformulate, just think about the E and M sector alone, just this higher form symmetry, we, you can reformulate then normal magnetohydrodynamics as a true effective field theory using this higher form symmetry. 
This is a program that's happened over the last five years or so. It started with a paper um, that I wrote with Diego Hoffman and Sasha Grozdanov, and since then it's been quite a lot of work. I think this is, this is a useful, a surprisingly useful thing to do. You learn new things about MHD. The theory that we get is not actually exactly the same as textbooks. Uh, it's more general because it uses only symmetries. Okay? It's a, I think this is a useful program. Hydrodynamics with Atoft anomalies, in other words, what you get if e &M is, is frozen, this is an extremely rich and well-studied field. Um, again, uh, this was first understood in the context of holography and later developed by lots of people. There, if you have a current like this where the non-conservation is given by a Toft anomaly, there are very precise terms that appear in the hydrodynamics that are completely determined by the anomalies. Okay? So the second law of thermodynamics results in there being very precise terms. This is a, a super interesting subject that is by now very well studied, very deep. Okay. The problem of studying QED type theories at finite temperature is something that, of course, is actually physically relevant in that it's useful for the early universe and for problems in astrophysics. So many people have tried to study this. The normal approach is basically to do the following thing. Take these results, the results from this thing, which work if e is non-dynamical, and then couple them perturbatively in some perturbative scheme to electromagnetism. So stick them into Maxwell's equations and see what happens. Um, this uh, gives reasonable results, okay? So this, this is thoroughly reasonable. But it is not an effective field theory. It is not a symmetry-based approach, okay? So you might think it's missing some things. For example, there have been some recent lattice simulations of a system, which I'll describe on the next slide, which doesn't actually quite agree with what you get from there. So there's genuinely a problem to be solved here. And finally, there has been uh, one attempt, I would say, which is completely uh, universal, trying to basically combine this approach with the entropy current and this non-conservation equation. Uh, they tried to do this to do hydro in a systematic way. It's a very interesting paper, but it's only self-consistent if the anomaly coefficient is treated perturbatively, in other words, a small parameter. That's just not the case, because the anomaly coefficient is an integer. Okay? So this, again, gives very reasonable results, but I think there should be a, a, a more universal theory still. Okay. okay. So um, let me say a few words about the phenomenology, the, the way to do this in a phenomenological manner. What you can do is you can basically um, imagine taking the results from when e &M is frozen, which involve getting an extra piece here in your electric charge current, and then coupling that to Maxwell's equations and seeing what happens. Okay? This is super reasonable. And what you find is that if you do that, the axial charge is no longer conserved. In fact, it decays with some decay rate that you can calculate from this. All right? It's quadratic in the magnetic field. That's what, that's what you get from this. And now there are simulations that try to do this, that actually set up a system which has the same symmetries, and, and look at this. Um, and they actually find that, indeed, the decay rate uh, is quadratic in the magnetic field. Okay, this is a straight line, more or less, I think. Um, however, the prefactor that they get, this number, disagrees with the sort of elementary arguments by about a factor of 10. Okay? In fact, when we first started looking at this, it was a factor of 60. After that, they improved their theoretical estimates and got it down to a factor of 10. But this factor of 10 now seems to be stable. So you see, something is working right, but still there's something to be done, I claim. OK, okay. so let me tell you what we actually did to try to solve this problem. So um, we first of all tried to do a sort of holographic experiment. This paper, actually, where we did this work, came out before the more refined understanding of non-invertible symmetries. So I'll tell you what we actually did and how it relates to that story. How am I doing on my new refined time? What we did was basically we set up a holographic system that has the right symmetries that I described, where by right symmetries here, I mean, I mean these two equations. Okay? There's a conserved two-form current, and there's a non-conserved one-form current with the non-conservation given by this equation. Okay? So we set up a holographic system that looks like this. This is work done with Arpit and with Ruth Gregory. And um, we set up a system. I'm going to insert an anomaly coefficient here so you can track through and see where the anomaly is in various things. You need a two-form field and a one-form field in the bulk to represent these two things. A should not be gauge invariant because you don't want it to be gauge invariant. And you can write down an action that does what you need. This is actually rather intricate and complicated. The way we actually got it was by taking the well-studied action for the Atoft anomaly and doing a duality in the bulk to replace a certain vector field with a two-form field. What that really just means is that we are representing boundary conditions differently in this theory. But it's very non-local to write those boundary conditions in the original field. So it, everything looks quite different, basically. But you get some sort of action, and you can now study uh, everything. You can calculate anything you want now in this action. You should view this as an experiment in trying to figure out what is happening with this hydrodynamic theory. 
So for example, we calculated, among other things, that charge relaxation rate. Okay? So we calculated it, and that is these blue dots here. The way you do it is that you fluctuate these fields, they, they wiggle in, they fall on a black brain, they bounce back, and there's normal holographic techniques to calculate all these things. I'm happy to talk about them more, and Arpit has a poster where you can learn more about the details on how we did this. And um, we got this blue curve here, okay? And um, at small b, this is quadratic, and in fact, the coefficient of the quadratic part actually does agree with the elementary physics arguments, provided you identify things in the appropriate manner. This is not what the lattice people find, okay? The lattice people actually found that it just did not agree with this. We don't find the discrepancy in, in this thing. And, um, okay, I can, uh, afterwards I'm happy to talk about why I think there's, these two things are different. But what this suggests is that there may be, should be some universal description, at least at small b fields, okay? And so what we are trying to do now is construct that universal description. And um, I'm just gonna mumble some words on how we're doing this. Basically, the way in which we're doing this is using, using the effective theory of hydrodynamics that was described by Mike uh, in his talk earlier. This is a very intricate thing, but in principle, it's completely well posed. There's a real-time action formulation, so you can just try to write down the theory that satisfies the symmetries and look at what hydro theory comes out. So we are currently trying to do this. The way in which this works is you have two times, and one way to think about why there are two times is because you're evolving a density matrix in time, but each leg of the density matrix can be unitarily evolved, so you have u of t1 and u of t2, and you end up with two times at the end of the day. And then you realize the hydro degrees of freedom in a, in a correct manner, which was told to us uh, in a series of papers by, by these people, okay? And um, basically, there's an algorithm to do this, and so you can write down that algorithm. This was very recently extended to the higher form case. These people wrote down a, re represented MHD in this formalism, and we then try to take that and modify that um, to, uh, with this new anomaly structure. And here, I'll basically conclude with just saying what's happening here. So roughly speaking, what happens is you end up with some sort of Stuckelberg fields for your U1 currents, okay? So phi is like a Stuckelberg field. And morally speaking, what's happening is you take something which is invariant and doesn't have any weird anomaly structure, then you add a term like phi j wedge j to this, okay? Where j is the higher form current. This equation is very schematic because you see j is actually defined by differentiating this partition function with respect to some source b. So this doesn't make sense the way I wrote it, but you can make it make sense by putting Lagrange multipliers and so on. So there's a, there's a way to deal with this, which we did. And um, an interesting thing is we have verified that if you do this, you can actually construct these defect operators within the degrees of freedom describing this hydro theory, okay? So we can realize the non-invertible symmetry on this dissipative action. In fact, we can realize two of them because you get one for each of the legs of the, the contour, okay? And um, we have not completely succeeded yet, so now I'm gonna tell you what we did not succeed in doing. There's a technical problem. There's something, basically, if you mess up this hydro theory, it's very easy to end up in a superfluid phase, and uh, we seem to be doing that. There's a certain symmetry that preserves that makes you not be in a superfluid phase. We're having trouble preserving that symmetry, and so we always end up in an axial superfluid phase. I believe this is a technical problem and not a conceptual one. Having said that, it's a technical problem that's persisted for a number of weeks now, and so you know, the jury is still out. Uh, you know, so my feelings on this change from day to day. You can ask me, you can ask Arpit what he thinks. But um, for a second, if we ignore that, let's just ignore that and just calculate with it anyway, you get a term coming from this anomaly thing. It's quite interesting, okay? You see, what you get is it is determined by the resistivity, the microscopic resistivity in this theory, and a bunch of things that are given by the, that are fixed in terms of the anomaly, okay? Uh, this basically is the same sort of thing you get if you do this weekly gauge story, except that you see the coefficients that appear here now are actually have a universal meaning. In other words, I can tell you how to find this from a Kubo formula in the dynamical ENM theory. So that's a different thing that was not possible before. So for example, a, a thing to do now is maybe write to the simulation people and ask, see, if they could compute this from the simulation and then check if using this thing here removes the factor of 10 discrepancy that they find in, in their story. So this is the kind of thing that I hope to do with this. Okay, I've gone well over, so uh, there are future things to do which really involve figuring this out. And uh, to summarize, um, we did some things. There's a non-invertible symmetry which is very interesting. Uh, you can use that to solve what I believe is a long-standing problem in hydrodynamics. We hope to solve this, we have not yet, but no matter what, I think it's still interesting. Thank you. Sorry for going 13 minutes over.
Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Okay, so um, basically, uh, the I think the, your question is probably best answered without adding this extra axial charge stuff. Okay, so you can just write down MHD now in a sort of universal formalism without the difference between our formalism and and the old work is that it does not assume any splitting of the system into electromagnetic degrees of freedom and matter degrees of freedom, which is always assumed in traditional MHD treatments. Um, so for example, if electromagnetic interactions are strong, our theory is, should still work, even though the basic one doesn't, okay? So in principle, there should be experimental consequences, you know? There's an, our equation of state that we can have in our theory, for example, is more general than the one that's possible in normal MHD. So um, I, I think, I've talked to some, so let's see if I cited these papers or not. I've talked to some astro people. There, there's some things you can try to do with this that I'm happy to tell you about afterwards. But I think the main difference is just that we write the most general thing possible with the symmetries, which is not really what's in textbooks. In fact, the recent paper by Hong and company, this one over here, is actually called uh, Magnetohydrodynamics for Neutron Stars. Because they really, you know, they really made it, they, because they have an action formalism, it's even more transparent still, I think, what the constraints are and, and so on. So yeah, so I, I think that it would be fun to, to do. Uh, if, you, if you know any neutron star related questions, please tell me. There's some applications that we did with to pulsars that I can tell you about. They sort of, I'm not sure they, yeah. I'm happy to tell you about them, but maybe it's not of interest to everyone, but, um, but yeah.